So if you made games before programmable shading, and a few of us in this room probably have from looking around, uh, you're a legend, right? It, it was, there was almost nothing you had to control the visual look. It, it was all about really low-level tricks. Um, and from our perspective, that's kind of antiquity, right? Like, like, we live in awe of these games from the pre-programmable shading era, but they don't directly speak to the kind of workflows and the kind of visuals we get today. So it's, you know, things like Half-Life 1, a right? great game, but not, not, not remotely comparable to what we're doing today. And then the world that you live in if you're making games today probably involves technology like these. And this is the era that I claim ended on Monday. You have rasterization, and that's it. And you have programmable shading, and programmable shading over about two decades has given us amazing power. Right? We've seen the, the incredible speed up of GPUs, we've seen the incredible fidelity of games, and it's taken a long time for people to learn how to master this, but we've, we can make amazing visuals now. But it also means you live in a world where you have shadow map cascades and bias and separate shadow maps for the hero shadows, where you have screen space effects that look fantastic in the best case and that you spend months tuning in the worst case so that they don't completely fail. So your reflections and your AO are going crazy all over the place. You have no good solution for transparency, even though we've created a lot of stop gaps that in special cases will give really high quality results. It's something that has to be hand tuned for every scene and every material. And then when you really want good quality lighting, what do you do? You actually use ray tracing and you bake your light maps and probes offline anyway. So you're already using ray tracing, it's just it's an offline production process. And the problem with that is it gives great quality, but an artist moves the light and then they wait one minute or 10 minutes or 20 minutes to see the lighting change in the level. And so production is blocked today on artist time. Right? That's what we're limited by, not, not engineer time. Because artists are spending so much time working around all the limitations of the real-time techniques. They're just too complicated to go much farther under rasterization techniques alone. And then the artists themselves are blocked on the baking process of ray tracing. So I think you're a hero if you're making games like this, because the amazing thing is that the games that are coming out today look almost as good as offline rendered films in some of the best shots, right? So we have really unique looks across a variety of hardware, a variety of platforms. People are getting the performance up there, they're getting the visuals. They're getting the visual fidelity, they're getting the complexity and the shading. But again, it's not because it's inherent in the engine, it's because of the heroics of the art team and the engineering team, and they've kind of hit the limit. We just can't afford to produce games with art teams that are twice as big or twice as many techniques shoved together. And so what happened on Monday with the advent of real-time ray tracing being directly integrated into a cross-vendor API is you can now immediately, and I think we're going to see games in the coming months, that ship in sort of a ray raster coexistence, where you take all of the great things that we've gotten out of our raster pipelines, and then you start using ray tracing to make it so that baking isn't an offline process. It's a slow interactive process for the artist. But they don't go get a coffee when they move the sun. They, they, they just wait four seconds and it converges. And where the probes maybe can be dynamic at runtime. So we start using the structures we already have, but the line between runtime and production starts to become a lot more fluid and a lot more dynamic. And you're going to see reflections and hard shadows. And there's all kinds of great stuff at, at GDC now about exactly how to do these and how to start rolling that out on technology that's available right now. And what's interesting about coexistence is to me, that's the point where film was exactly 20 years ago. This was peak rasterization for film. And Pixar is a bug's life perfectly captures this. So absolutely beautiful film, has great global illumination, which is all done by artists hand-placing bounce lights. It has ambient occlusion passes, it has shadow maps, it has screen space effects. It has all the technology that would be extremely familiar to anyone using a real-time game engine today. And it had all of the production problems with that. There was just no headroom. They were spending all of their time manually tweaking shots to get them good. And they actually have an advantage over us, right? Which is, it's not interactive. So a bug's life, you render the shot, and if the techniques all kind of blew up because of the combinatorial explosion, then you just tweak it and re-render the shot. In the game, it's got to work reliably, even if somebody moves the camera or the light at runtime. And then the coexistence is that to get the water and the glass, there's a couple shots of the refraction in this film. That's where they added ray tracing on top. 
Right? So it was, it was peak rasterization. This, this was sort of the height of micropolygon rasterization on RenderMan. And it was beautiful, but it was the ceiling. And I think that's the coexistence. And so the coexistence is this year, but we need to get out of that mode as fast as possible.